My name is Danny Fenton and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Hi again modelers and time for another installment from my Oster Autocrat. So this week we're going to be looking at the final few bits of detail that I'm going to be putting on the model. Um, and then it's just a case of hooking up the systems, which are the servos are already in, the push rods, everything's already done. Um, I just need to fit the fuel tank, the plumbing, and the engine. And then we do a bit of radio setup, which again, mostly has been done already. So once we've done these final details, that's probably going to be the end of the videos, I'm afraid. Um, there may be one more, if I can find somebody to man a camera, and we'll go out to the flying field and we'll... Um, <clears throat> will attempt to fly it. So, um, so maybe one more after this one. So in this one, I'm going to show you a few little uh, remaining bits and pieces, including a little bit of RTV molding, which, which you've seen before, but um, could be interesting. And it doesn't hurt to reinforce the process. Okay, so let's get started.
So first of all, <coughs> I took a block of this is maple, scrap block of maple, and I drilled a looks like about a three mil hole straight through it. Then I took it to the bench sander and I sanded it at an angle. That should give us a perfect little tool to form some lith plate into to create the uh, the rudder shrouds for the back of the Oster. I'll go and get some lift plate and we'll get it annealed. So now I'm going to take a look at the pitot tubes. We need to make two tubes coming down through this aluminium bracket and then the top one is straight with a point on it and a tube and the bottom one angles down slightly and then forwards and is blunt. Looking at this drawing of this picture and then looking at the strut, if I orientate it the same way, you can see that we need a tube that is going to run from the top, this bracket, to about four fifths of the height, and that's where the bracket will be. So if we come down to say, if we make it, let's get the right measurement, like in millimeters metric. So if we bring it down to seven, six, 70, 70 millimeters from the joint. This beam is a little bit higher. So we know that this has got to be 70 millimeters long. Well, the wing underside here. And then we want to come down 70 to here. So that's how long the tube is going to be. So that what I'm going to do and that's roughly the size that I need it to be going by that strut. So what I'm going to use is two things. I have an aluminium tube. This is aluminium rod. Now the benefit of using rod as opposed to tube is you can bend rod really really easily whereas tube it tends to kink. Now what I want to do I want to simulate these rubber joining hoses using um, heat shrink tubing. So what I'm going to do is just try the smallest piece of heat shrink tubing I have, the smallest diameter. I'm just going to take a short piece of that, stick it on the rod, and then we're going to see if it actually shrinks down enough to, uh, to do what we want. Needs to be a snug fit, you see. And uh, yeah, that's good. That'll do nicely. I think that'll simulate the rubber hose on the end. So we need to bring one down and then bend it there. Then we need to radius it. I'm just resting it on this. And there you can see how that radius is beautifully, but no kinks or anything else. And we need to trim it there. At the end, I'm going to file it now because I forget. The end of this one, if you recall, it's actually sharpened. Now it should have a hole in the end. Ours does not. So there we have 
there we have, sorry, there we have one of the down pipes. Okay, now this one needs this section of rubber hose, and that goes around there. And more of it goes up than down. So we'll do it to there. Now let's see what happens when we try and shrink that. Well, the area around the bend is not terribly happy. What we'll try for the other one is we'll try putting the heat shrink on first and then bend it. See if that works. So that's the forward one. Try bringing that down to about there. Needs to start at the same point as that one. Shrink it. And then we've got a lovely finish. We've got some printing on it, which you probably would get on the rubber hose. So that is the same height across the top. So now what we need to do is we need to bend it with the middle of the bend there. So we've got our Allen key to do the radius. And there, as you can see, that is the way to do it. Put the heat shrink on first, then bend it. Next on the agenda is the handle for the door. Now, all the Osters I've looked at have different handles, and um, it's very confusing. When I made my chipmunk a few years ago, I made a mould for the door handles. And let's see if I can find one of the door handles in here. To show you. 
I'm sure there should be one in here. Ah, here's the original. So that's the original that I carved out of Kemi wood. I hadn't realised I'd done it out of Kemi wood, to be honest, but I did. And then that was then moulded to produce, well, it was then cast in silicon and made a mould. And then I was able to create several handholds for the canopy. There was two on the chipmunk. So I plan to do something similar, similar shape, because I like the shape. It looks, it looks correct. Whether it is correct, it's another matter. But I have seen one where they're like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same shape as I've done there, but these are for one sixth scale. I buy Kemi wood in fairly large blocks from Phil Clark and Fly Tracers. These are a couple of just off cuts that I have. And I think probably that one, or that one, either of those two, let's put those aside, will probably produce quite a nice handle. I think I'm going to make it that long. And uh, I'm going to try for that shape. Anyway, I'll cut that out and then we'll see how we go from there. Once you've got the basic shape cut out with saws and warding files and needle files, then you can go to the foam pads and just start taking those corners off. And hopefully, from what was a block of Kemi wood, a door handle will merge. It's quite useful for holding, is once you've got that round bit sorted out, glue it to a stick. Makes it much easier to hold and when you're you know using the files and stuff and uh, it's usually pretty strong okay so now I can use my foam pad gently to continue rounding off the shape so I've got the profile just need to keep fine-tuning it taking all the edges off till I'm happy. Okay, I'll keep doing this. Give you a call when I'm done. So here is the, the finished item, the finished handle. As you can see I've left some of the bamboo skewer attached because I actually wanted to make that stalk a little bit longer. As if you imagine, you've got to get your hand around the handle, so it needs to be far enough away from the door. So what we do now is we cast that in silicon, and then tomorrow, once the silicon is dry, we cut it open, remove this bit, and then we can go ahead and cast some resin versions. So let's clear a bit of the space. This place is a tip. So in here, we have Lego. In, the, in this box here I have bases, so I only need one. And then the amount of space I need around this is not too great. As you can see, I could almost do it on that. But I'll go one more, just to give myself plenty of meat around, around the object that I'm casting. Glue is quite difficult to get off the surface of the, the part, so I'm going to use you who pull it's, um, it's a good glue for this sort of stuff. So, and it, it comes off and it can rub away to, to clean up quite nicely. So, let's get that how we want it. 
Now what you should really do if you were really good at this is you'd have air sprues coming from the front and the rear to allow for the air to get out as you pour it. Then all we do is we build the dam around the outside. And that's enough. So then all we have to do is kind of work out roughly through experience how much silicon it's going to take to fill that mold. So here we have the Maragon Arts and Crafts RTV silicon that I like to use. I've given you there a details before. Maragon Arts and Crafts. Certainly in the UK they're a, a great supplier of stuff and it's much cheaper than some of the specialist shops. So depending on how hard you want this, um, you know the, um, the shore strength depends on what percentage of hardener you add to the RTV. At 4% pot life is 2 to 3 hours, cure is 24 to 36 hours. So I'm probably going to do a 5% mix in there. Okay, so I've zeroed the scales and have a paper cup ready, a clean paper cup. I'm going to add in here how much I think will go in there and it won't be much. And not as much as that, <laughs> but never mind. So that's 28.1 at 5%. We need 1.4 grams of hardener. So I'll zero it out. We want 1.4. That's 1.8. So it's going to go off a little bit quicker. No bad thing. The only thing about it is if it goes off a bit quicker, it doesn't tend to be such hard RTV, but I think in this case we're fine. Then we need a stirring stick and we need to stir this for at least five minutes. You can see already the colour in the bottom. I've shown this several times on videos in the past, but it doesn't hurt to Show you again. You got to make sure you get it right from in the corners of the cup. It should go a lovely pale blue when you've got it all mixed. But as I said, don't even think about using it until you've been stirring for at least five minutes. This is full of bubbles. So what do we do? You can even see the bubbles. So to get rid of these, I have a vacuum chamber. This here is a vacuum chamber. It has a vacuum pump, a big pot with a lid on top. This is the vacuum pot. There's a lid. And what we're going to do is put our mixed RTV in the bottom of the pot. Hopefully you can actually see that. And then on top, we put the lid. Now we need the output closed off and the input open. Then we turn on the pump. Sorry about the noise, but keep your eye on the bubbles. Pushing down on the lid, this is a bit of a seal. And I'm not sure if you can see the pressure going up on the dial. Now if you watch down into the pot and look at our blue RTV silicon while this is all going on, you should see something magic happening. And there we are at 
point A to the bar. And as you can see, all the bubbles are coming out of the, uh, the silicon resin. Not only are they coming out, you can see the whole lot is rising. There's so many, uh, much air. See how it's foaming? It's going mad. And it's now up to about half the pot, and there it's collapsed. The bubbles got so big, it's collapsed back down. And we're at around about minus one bar. So we'll leave this running. I like to keep it on until those bubbles have gone and there are no more. So just have to be patient. So you can see it's more or less slowed right down now. Now we're at at least minus one bar. So the bubbles we're getting out now are minuscule. Um, under, under normal atmospheric pressure they are squashed so that they're not uh, bearing on this at all. So we can turn the pump off at this point knowing full well that we've got 99.9% .9 of all the air bubbles out. But I'm going to call it quits at that. There's plenty. You know, I've removed nearly all the air out of that. And when I say nearly, I mean <laughs> really, really nearly. As soon as you remove the suction, it dies right back. I'm not I, the the bubbling goes on for a lot longer since I've been using these plastic uh, these paper cups, and I'm wondering if in the rolled edges of the cup there is um, there's air trapped and it's actually air coming out of the uh, the paper cup. So I think the next one I'll do I'll use a plastic cup, and uh, we'll see what the difference is. Right, so we're still at minus one bar. I'm going to let the air in, let, let the air in. Gradually. Then when it fully open, you lift the lid off, and there is our RTV. So now the RTV has been what's called degassed. And we're now going to try and hope that I've poured enough that I can fill this mould. Now the trick to not getting any more air back in there again is to fill from the bottom up. So you need a thin stream of RTV into the bottom of the mould and then you need to gradually fill the base up and let it climb up the sides and over the part gradually. Hopefully forcing all the air bubbles forwards as it goes. You don't have the vacuum chamber to remove the bubbles. As you're pouring it like this, you'll actually see them in the stream. And we had just about enough. So now all we have to do is leave this for at least 24 hours. So we'll come back tomorrow, hopefully open the mould up, remove the part, and then the mould is then ready for casting some bi-resin I'll probably use, which is, an, is a two-part polyester resin. So we'll, we'll probably do that tomorrow. Cast a couple of door handles and we're away. 
for the steps. I've been thinking about these long and hard um, and I tried two attempts at making them. Um, I tried making one out of silver soldering brass tubes together but actually it was working reasonably well but it, it, it well wasn't very elegant. So then what I did was I thought I wonder what I can do with um, aluminium tube. So what I've done I've drilled a hole through the strut and the metal plate and as you can see it's at 45 degrees well about 45 degrees back at 45 degrees to the side to give me the right sort of angle. Then I thought uh, if I use an aluminium tube so let me show you what I've done I've taken an aluminium tube and I've just bent it like that and then I've glued over the top of it using CA, thin CA is aerofoil section brass tube now if I could have got this in aluminium well you probably can but I, I didn't even wait I had this so short length of brass tube aerodynamic so make sure that you've got it handed correctly because obviously one side the aerofoil goes one way the other side it goes the other way so then the brass tube is glued onto that then I took another piece of aluminium tube and just laid it alongside that one to give the length, uh, to give the, the step. I could have used two pieces of tube with the same bend in it, but I didn't need to. That was, you know, this was enough. The step itself, what I've done is if I just slide some heat, some very close sized heat shrink tubing over the over the duo, make sure the little bit of text that's on these things is at the bottom, and then just using a little bit of heat, shrink it down, and there you can see we have a step. Now on the full size it has a blanking plate, and I thought how am I going to do that? So what I'm doing, I don't know whether you can see, is I'm cutting the end of the heat shrink tubing off where it protrudes. I'm actually going to go further than that. I'm going to sand it. I'm not sure how well heat shrink tubing is going to sand. <laughs> Probably not very well. There we go, that's close enough. So now the heat shrink tubing is flush with the end of the two tubes. Then take a small piece of heat shrink tubing that I've laid out flat. I simply put, take some super glue, stand, stand the rest on there. Put heat, I'll put CA all the way around where it meets. Then you zap it. You want it to set. And what I want it to do is to set with a bit of a bead around the edge. That makes it harder. Then with scissors, just cut round. What I want to retain is the stiff area, which is the bead of super glue on the black. As you can imagine, the heat shrink is not very stiff. But where the glue is, it is. So, and there we have it. Then we take the strut and that's the top. 
So this is the leading edge. So this has to go through from underneath. And at that angle. So then as you can see, it goes kind of like that. So I'm just going to feed in some CA. Let it soak in for a second. Give it a quick splash. And then I'll do the same to the bottom. There we are. So there we have the step. So it's been 24 hours since we cast the resin and it's uh, good and solid. There's no bubbles in the top. So that's exactly what we would want because of the what we did about removing the air. There's the, the remainder of the silicon and it's, um, it's set good and solid. So what we do is we break down the box and try and remove the Lego parts should all come apart fairly, fairly easily. Just sometimes we get a little seepage under the edge, which makes them a little bit recalcitrant. And then we got the, the base pieces. There's the bottom of our... So what we need next is a sharp scalpel. So I'm going to put a new number 10 or number 11 blade into this. Nice new number 11 in there. Now we know roughly what the shape of this beast is. It's going to run from there to about there. First of all, I'm just going to run down there until I could feel it. And I'll run down this side until I can feel it. And then I'll just spread it apart, as you can see. We need a little bit more, just cutting just there. And just there. With a bit of luck, that should come straight out. It's just gripping a little bit there, there we go. It's not usually this bad. And there we have it. So there's our handle. We have a two-part uh, resin, by resin it's called. By resin G26 is the one I use. So use one of these little pots. So we'll try for one gram. Point one might change to one point two any second. Stayed at one point one, doesn't matter. Point one. It's very difficult when you mix the ratios so small like this because. It's very easy to be out by a fraction and it have more bearing on the, the setting qualities. 
point one of the difference when you're only pouring a gram is ten percent. As you can see, I put some bits of Lego around the mould just to hold it close. And that's the normal colour I'd expect. It goes white. So let's have a look at this. See how this has gone. And we're still missing the tip. But that's not so bad actually, because I could just sand the shape of that and that one. So that actually works fairly well. It's a nice rounded off tip. Let's see if I can convert the other one into that sort of shape. It's not quite as nice as it would have been. So there we've kind of recovered the situation. And those two handles will probably On the starboard rear side of the fuselage, near the tail, you can see in this picture here, just about, there's a small access cover, disc type cover, and it's an aluminium cover that you twist and it can come off the panel or come off the fabric. Um, and it's for getting inside the, uh, the rear of the fuselage to access some vitally important piece of structure. So what I've got here, as you can probably see, I've got a few bits and pieces that I've made. I've made some shrouds for the cable exits. I've made the disc that we just shown you on the picture for the rear access. I made another one, but this one's too big, so we won't be using that. Also, one of these lead out bearings is just too small. It's the right size, but because of the way I've made the lead out on the model, um, it won't actually won't actually work. So I'll be using the big one and the smaller one. So, so there we go. Let's get going. So this side we've got a it's a more flush um, area. So we should be perfectly all right to use the smaller ones. <laughs> right. So what I'm using here is just basically a barbecue skewer with a blob of blue tack on the end, and the blue tack allows me to pick up items that are quite tiny and this is going to be positioned like that on the model so I'm just going to hold it down while I preferably straight Uh, 
I just wick in a little tiny amount of CA. This is a small detail, but it uh, it really stands out if you don't do it. Oh, that's gone a bit messy there. Little square of kitchen towel. We'll just wick up the excess, and then that should give us a nice cable exit. Just make sure it still moves. Some CA had got into the uh, into the the joint. The next thing I want to add is the access cover. And the access cover sits around about there. On the photograph, it is just below the rudder cables, just barely below the rudder cables, and fairly close to the to the hinge. So I'm going to go for there. Let's just put a little bit of CA. to wick the excess up and that should do us for this side. What you can see here is the lithoplate wheel cover that I've made. I simply dished it in a wooden mold and then I punched the five screws uh, that would normally hold it on. I was going to use screws to actually attach it to the wheel but at this scale the screws would just be too big even the tiniest ones I've got. So I thought punching and giving an impression of screw heads was probably as good as I could go. So that's, um, that's the wheel covers fitted. And the way they're attached is I've put four big dollops of silicon adhesive, which is used in aquariums and this sort of stuff. So it, it remains slightly flexible, but, um, but gives a good grip. So the, the wheel is stuck or the cover is stuck to the wheel, not the tire, but the wheel with silicon. So if anything happens and I need to get in there, I should just be able to slide a, scal a scalpel between the tire and the cover and break that joint, sort the wheel out or the collet. There's a collet under there holding the wheel on, which I don't like using collets, but it's a fairly good way if you've got a cover which can, can hide the collet. Nothing worse than seeing the collet. So, so that's the cover. Up here you can see the Venturi. Now this uh, creates a vacuum and the vacuum is used to drive the, the instruments like the artificial horizon and things like that. Um, so what I've done with this is I've drawn it in Fusion 360 and then I sent the drawing, or I then converted the .dwg file that come, came out of Fusion, converted that to an STL file. Um, I sent the STL to my friend Eric, who then used some software called Slicer and sliced it so that he could print it on a 3D printer. Uh, and in this case, he's printed it on a resin uh, printer, which gives you a much finer resolution. Um, Here is another one from the same batch. It ended up with a little chip that is easily repaired, but this has been uh, sanded and primed and sanded and primed and cleaned up a lot, and it still needs quite a bit more cleaning up. Um, it was possible that the subject aircraft I was going to model would have two of these, one on either side, which some did. Some also had one uh, a Venturi that's half the size of that, Others had ones where it didn't have the forward cone and just had the rear cone. So there's a variety. And I've chosen the one um, that was fitted to Gagto, Golf Alpha, Golf Tango Oscar. But I didn't eventually end up doing that. I ended up, as you know, doing Uniform Juliet. So 
this is not really the right scale, but I, it's, it's fun scale, so it's it'll do nicely. So there we have it. The model is virtually complete. I have a little bit of plumbing to do um, and a little bit of remote glow setup to do, but uh, in effect, the model is done and ready to uh, to test. If I can get hold of a cameraman, I'll try and video the maiden. Uh, but otherwise, that's it from me. If I hope you've enjoyed the series and I look forward to seeing you on the next lot.